Hey, good afternoon. Fantastic to be here. You know, when uh, Marianne Jansson, Sarko Jansson, invited me to speak in here, she said, well, all the titles are digitalizing something. And in my sort of a crazy moment, I said, okay, then I'll speak of digitalizing leadership. And then when I realized what I had done the next Sunday morning when I was working on this presentation, I'm thinking like, oh dear, I have finally gotten myself into real trouble. Leadership, now can that be digitalized? Maybe not. But then I thought, well, let's push our thinking. Let's push our thinking and see how much not maybe replacing leaders, but complementing we can do. And I took sort of a large circle discovery journey around uh, a lot of related topics from machine intelligence to robotics to all these fantastic areas that are developing very, very fast at the moment. And I tried to provide, and I will try and provide you sort of a summary of what that all is. Now, question, ladies and gentlemen. How many of you think that there is a machine, a computer, a supercomputer out there that is smarter than all of us together here today? Hands up. There are people thinking we are kind of getting on maybe 10% are of the opinion that Yes, the supercomputer might exist that is smarter than all of us, but I would suspect that many of us think that there is a computer that probably is smarter than any one of us. Certainly in my case, that is probably true. But let's think about this. So am I for real, first of all? I show up in here talking about uh, leadership, intelligence, artificial machine, robotics, and yeah, this is my big dream, that I could sort of clone myself and be in many places at once. And maybe that even is possible, uh, as I learned doing this study. So I have spent a lot of my time around the world doing research in different areas, and perhaps this notion of how we can use the kind of resources available to us in computing, in data science, is something that currently is really, really exciting for me. So the starting point that I put to myself as I embarked on this journey was this. What if, ladies and gentlemen, we already work for a computer? Think about it. What if we already work for some sort of machine intelligence? And to examine this conjecture, obviously I have no data, I put out three hypotheses that I want to share with you. So the hypothesis one is perhaps the most extreme, if you like that we actually live in a matrix-like simulation. And you'll be surprised, unless you're familiar with this brand of research, that there are actually a lot of rather smart people who think that this may well be the case in some likelihood. The hypothesis, too, is the one that I put to you earlier, that maybe our everyday life is already governed by machines much more than we care to admit. I'll bet. Some of you came here because your calendar app told you to do so. Yeah? I'll bet some of you came here because the GPS said Telakkakatu 8 is right here. I'll bet we actually use a lot of machine intelligence without thinking about it. And that is good, because it sort of helps us to do our things more efficiently. But as we go on, I also want to point out some potential concerns that at least we need to be somewhat uh, aware of. And the third hypothesis, humans and machines merge by 2045. If you are a nerd, you know who has said this, someone from the uh, sort of singularity tradition. Um, so we'll talk about that briefly as well. But as we think about this, we have about 30 years to be humans, and then according to uh, Ray Kurzweil, the man behind this hypothesis, the human and machine intelligence will be one. Think about it. So let's start this journey. Our world is very likely a, high, uh, a simulation. Now, 
if you read this style of literature, and it is not science fiction, it's somebody called Nick Boostrom at Oxford University. He has actually calculated that the likelihood that this is a simulation is about 20%. You can read his article in the Philosophical Quarterly. Uh, and some other people agree. Elon Musk, for instance, you may know him behind Tesla and the space travels, says that, you know, game technologies are moving so fast, they are so real, that it is actually very likely that soon we cannot make this difference between so-called reality and simulation. But this is the sort of a hypothesis that is kind of not here or there. I mean, mind you that already Plato, which is thousands of years ago, noted that we would not know, actually, if we lived in a cave and all we saw as prisoners in that cave were these shadows on the walls. So it's a very long tradition of thinking about this. And the notion that the world is a simulation is justified by Nick Bostrom by saying that, you know, we might be part of somebody's game, somebody's entertainment, the future selves, our Pe the people who come after us may be doing these simulations to find out their roots, understand themselves better, know their history, or be sort of like a game of civilization. Anybody playing that one? So maybe this is something that could be happening. I just hope that when the US election, I'm a US citizen, happens, I am on the version of the simulation where the good guys win. So let's just hope that I get over there. But OK, who knows? 20% chance. The, the hypothesis, too, which is about, yes, maybe we are much more dependent on these machines than we actually admit to ourselves, is perhaps something we are quite familiar with. I mean, I saw you all smiling when I asked, did you follow the calendar app or the, uh, some other uh, machine intelligence that told you to come here? So this uh, event or this evolution of machines has been going on for some time. Here are some very famous events around it from uh, IBM's Deep Blue beating Gary Kasparov, who won against the machine in 1996, but lost in 1997, because I think he felt a bit complacent. It is said that his game in 1997, when he lost, was particularly bad, uncharacteristically so. And I think there is some sort of lesson there about do not underestimate the opponent, even if it's a machine. Well, Turing test. Um, do you know what a Turing test is? It's by Alan Turing, who uh, cracked, among others, the Enigma code in the Second World War. And he's very fa famous for saying that, well, since we don't really know what intelligence is, let's think about if we can imitate intelligence. And that is the question. And then we get to this uh, kind of tri uh, experiment where we talk to a computer and to a human and we try and determine which one is the human, which one is the computer. And evidently this was passed in 2009 in the University of Reading where a computer that was simulating a 13-year-old Ukrainian boy, for some reason, actually convinced 33% of the Royal Society of London uh, audience that this was a person, not a computer. Well, we are well known or familiar with Watson winning Jeopardy, which is, of course, a game that I would lose in no time. You need a lot of uh, uh, sort of contextual knowledge. And then DeepMind from Google beating Go. So we are often, despite all these advances, we are very much uh, kind of exposed to these comforting idea, ideas that, well, yeah, machines are getting smarter and they are able to fool us, and they can actually beat us in our games. But there still are some jobs that machines can, cannot do. And this is a list that two MIT scholars, Eric Brynjolfsson and uh, uh, McAfee, Andrew McAfee, uh, put out recently, that machines cannot replace us in creative endeavors, or social interactions, or physical dexterity, which is 
true, but machines can also be creative. You can check something called the painting fool, which is a machine that is creating art. You may not like this art, but it is creative. You think about social interaction. Yes, machines, people all do that. If you think about Facebook, so maybe Facebook has created the equivalent of sort of a mice experiment where the mice actually starves because they push the button for the pleasure uh, 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 button in their brains. And so rather than eating, the mice is sort of clicking on the pleasure button. And it turns out that we get great pleasure in Facebook when our community, our friends, like what we post. So 44% of people like a lot of, uh, uh, or, or many times a day, they sort of push this like button. And for us, it's sort of like psychological candy. It's so good to get this reward. So certainly, the machines can at least facilitate this type of interaction. Physical dexterity, well, yes, machines are not quite as good in moving around. Of course, the automated self-driving cars are a big deal at the moment. There are Tesla factories that have 160 specialized ro robots, etc. So I think the point is not that the machines cannot replace us in that, but rather they can also be creative, they can learn languages. The Sony Computer Science Laboratory in Paris is looking at robots teaching each other a shared language. They can perhaps help us to be even more creative, more socially interactive, rather than just go for the instant reward, so to speak. So then the final frontier, if you wish, empathy. Can machines show empathy? What do you think? Who thinks machines can show empathy? You guys are good. This is almost 25%. So this, you may recognize, is a Sega robot cat. And I bought it to my mother, my aging mother. She didn't want it. You know why? Because it looked so real. She thought it was real. And she was afraid it was going to replace her real cat. I was shocked. The thing is really cute, okay, fine. But then I work with a group of researchers using an um, app called Slack. Maybe some of you do that too. What Slack is quite good at, I think, is showing empathy. It tells me things like, oh, you look so good today when I log in, or oh, do get all the sleep you can, your friends at Slack. It tells you this kind of very nice, empathetic sentences that nobody else tells me. Nobody has told me for days that I should get enough sleep. It's this Slack that tells me that, you know, do take care of yourself, stretch a little bit. Oh, the day just got so, be so much better. You are here, was today. I mean, for heaven's sake, ladies and gentlemen, machines are much better at empathy than most of us because we don't have time to go tell all these things. So that one is busted. Okay, so where does that then leave us? Take me to your leader. So these are just some of the examples that I'm sure all of you are very familiar with. Uh, maybe you use Amy to schedule meetings. You may use Siri to ask questions. Siri actually is quite funny sometimes. One of my colleagues was very mad at Siri because uh, Siri was giving a very stupid answer to a question he asked. And Siri says, what? You think I'm stupid? After all I've done for you? <laughs> so, so maybe the Google um, uh, um, uh, engineers or software coders have a good sense of humor. Who knows? Um, ICEO is an interesting one. It was created by Institute for the Future in Palo Alto, California, sort of an experiment whether they could put together uh, a software that used other um, software apps to complete a task a CEO would complete. And this ICEO did just well in terms of providing this analytical report to a Fortune 500 client. Alicia T is very interesting. I don't know if there's anybody from Tieto here, but this is what Tieto just announced, that they have uh, appointed an artificial intelligence called Alicia T into their board, which is quite interesting. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how Alicia T is uh, 
viewing the strategy of, of growth going forward. Of course, our cars are full of microprocessors. They do things we don't even notice and sometimes against even our wishes. We have supercomputers in our pocket, etc. Now, this all is kind of like, okay, interesting, maybe a bit anecdotal examples here and there. But what is the really important question? I think it's this. Who wins the race to intelligence? It's not what we can do today, it's what we are able to learn and how fast. Now, if I think about my students at the university, you know, it takes four to five years to get a master's degree, if you're good. PhD, from five to ten years. It takes some people forever to grow up, right? <laughs> So we are not very fast in this as humans, are we? And then there is this uh, Moore's law and the sort of the notion of singularity that the computing capacity doubles every 18 months. And this is from the Singularity University where they estimate that about 2040 machines will indeed be more intelligent, depending of course on your definition, but in many ways than all human brains alive. And so I think that's the point. It's not what we can do today, but who will learn faster. And I think there, the machines are picking it up. And what's interesting about artificial intelligence, as I learned reading about it, was that we are kind of abandoned this notion of modeling and assumptions and trying to simulate reality. And we have gone to using the data big data uh, building on what we can conclude based on the empirical data and then kind of moving from there. So it may well be that in terms of some definition of intelligence, the machines are beating us left and right. So I've come to this conclusion, better to collaborate, right? So I hope I have a little nicer body than this in the future, but you know, it might be kind of helpful to have this type of extra hands and certainly the extra brain power, that memory computing power that this would allow me. And I'm quite comfortable with this. I think it would be fantastic to have a little bit extra intelligence that in some sense is machine based. So that was kind of like the uh, inclination that maybe this is already happening. So this notion of humans and machines merging by 2045, this is Ray Kurzweil, who is thought today as sort of the modern day Edison. He has a fantastic record in technological invention awarded by the US government many, many times, currently the director of artificial intelligence research at Google. So he's no lightweight. And so he has been for some time suggesting that by 2045, the machines and humans actually merge together. The boundary that in a way is a line drawn in water will disappear. And it's not gonna be like a big bang, you know, that now I'm a human, now I'm a machine, but slowly. We learn to work with the machines, we use their capabilities, we integrate some of these apps to our being much more than today and every day. And that can sound scary, but it could also be very comforting. comforting. And maybe that is a response to some of the problems. So, leadership. So if I said that this is about digitalizing leadership, and I would like to think of leadership as the ability to seduce others to come along, how good are people in this? Think about games out there. League of Legends is the most widely played game in the world. It's about 30 million people who play it in any one point in, in, in one day. 7.5 million at any point of uh, concurrently at the same time. So these are huge numbers. Clearly, there is some attraction. And then you can imagine if indeed we could sort of harness some of this machine intelligence to help us with this leadership. Maybe it's not such a bad thing, you know? You think about the digital leader, he would probably never have a bad day or be tired. He might remember who contributed something and not 
put the blame on somebody else if the things didn't go. I, I know you don't do this, but you know sometimes it's it's kind of human. Give credit where it's due. So maybe the digital leader actually would exercise the servant leadership we are so fond of talking about. We hope. And there is, of course, Dilbert as the ultra architect of uh, stupid leadership, so to speak. So. Which hypothesis cannot be rejected? That's the scientific way of looking at things. Hypothesis one about the simulation, we just don't know. Hypothesis two, we are already guided by machines more than we think, I think for sure. And maybe humans and machines are merging. If that's the case, I'll see you in the future. So the conclusion, so what? So as I was thinking about this, like what does that leave? Me, what does that leave us thinking through all these rather exciting and sometimes scare path, scary pathways? I think what we should do is abandon this sort of rather medieval attitude that humans are the center of the universe. Copernicus already showed us that the Earth is not the center of the universe where everything else moves around. And I think we have this tendency to think that we are so unique as humans without at all taking away from our worth. We are kind of putting down animals, we are putting down machines, everything else. And I think that is not helpful. If we took it uh, more in an open-minded, in an exploratory way, we could actually be able to develop these type of collaborative strategies where we and machines that we don't look down upon or we don't all the time claim that well they cannot really replace us can they we could look at how we can do things together and explore the potential and in that way we could augment the leadership and take advantage of this type of machine intelligence and servant leadership and i think this is important also because there is a danger that a world which is governed by algorithms actually is very discriminatory, uh, has a lot of side effects that are not good. For instance, if you are an African-American looking for uh, real estate rates searching on the web, the algorithms usually can detect that, researchers say, and they offer loans with much higher interest rates. If you are a woman searching for images of CEOs, and I did this test, the Barbie doll picture shows up. And in my case, uh, the fourth image of looking for a CEO, and I didn't say anything about women, no clothes, was what women CEOs wear. Ladies and gentlemen, I never buy clothes online, so I don't know how this algorithm figured that one out. So I think we need to be aware of this, and we need to be observant, and then intelligently harness the machine intelligence that hopefully will be our friend. Thank you very much.